Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Um, thank you all so much for coming again. I know we have some Nevada residents, we have some activists and we have some trappers. So I hope you all learn a lot. Um, we have a great group of speakers lined up and hopefully we can provide you with an introduction to trapping in Nevada, why trapping in Nevada is a problem, what's being done and how you can be involved. Um, first, a little bit of Zoom etiquette. If you have a question uh, during the presentation, feel free to type it in the chat. If it's quick, um, we can answer it during the presentation and otherwise we've saved some time for the end um, for a Q&A. My name is Tessa Archibald. Um, I have a master's degree in animals and public policy and I'm an intern with Wild Earth Guardians. This summer, I have been engaged in extensive research about trapping in Nevada. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a broad intro into that and the negative ecological impacts that it has. So next slide, we're gonna start off by talking about Nevada trapping in numbers. Our first number is 102,549. That's the number of fur bearing animals that have been trapped and killed in the past 10 years from Nevada wildlands. That's a lot of animals. Our next number is 1,020. Only a thousand people in Nevada have a trapping license, even though Nevada has a population of over 3 million people. This activity has real consequential effects on animals, as you can see from our last number. In addition, these 1,000 people have a disproportionate impact on the regulations that affect animal welfare and ecology in Nevada. Five, five dollars is all it takes to register a trap that can inflict real suffering on wild animals, companion animals, and people. 70. 70 dogs have been trapped in Nevada in the past four years. That's a lot of dogs. Companion animals can suffer grave damage, both physical and psychological, from a trapping event. We have a few guests who will speak about their experiences with trapped dogs later in the webinar. Our last number is 96. 96 hours is a trap check deadline in Nevada. So animals can be suffering, freezing, starving, and in pain in a trap for four days legally. That's the longest specified trap check deadline in the United States. So what are some of the animals that can be trapped in Nevada? Um, we have bobcats, coyotes, um, a few fox species, beaver, muskrat, mink, river otters, raccoons, skunks, badgers, weasels, and ring-tailed cats. There are no bag limits on any of these species, which means you can trap and kill as many of them as you want during trapping season. Also, the Nevada Department of Wildlife, NDOW, doesn't track any of these populations. So even though you can kill as many as you want, they have no idea how many are out there. The quote that you can see on the screen um, is directly from a fur bearer biologist at Endow in that they do not have or make population estimates for any of the listed species. Instead, they rely on harvest data, i.e. how many animals were trapped and killed each year. These harvest numbers have been decreasing for quite a bit for some of the species, and this is concerning because we don't know why. The declines could be due to decreasing pelt prices and reduced demand for fur, or from um, anthropogenic threats like reduced habitat, drought, climate change, or even trapping. It's impossible to know without tracking the populations. The kit fox, which you can see on the right, the cute little guy, is actually considered, considered vulnerable in Nevada, although no recent population assessments have occur, occurred. We have no idea how many there are, or where the population is trending. However, this species, as with all of the others, can be trapped with no limits. As many of us feel, all species and individuals are essential for their own intrinsic value. However, they also rely on each other to maintain a balanced ecosystem, both food web-wise, but also commensal. I'm gonna use the beaver as an example. Species like river otter and beaver have a strong relationship as river otters actually select habitats in places with more beaver impacts. These places have more food, stable water levels, and protection because of the vegetation. If a bunch of beavers are trapped, it ruins the habitat for otters, which we don't really know much about in Nevada. Beavers are also beneficial to humans 
and may be essential in times of drought as they have the unique ability to raise water tables. By building dams, beavers keep water where it is and ultimately saturate the soil and promote plant growth. In times of drought, this can be essential in helping ranchers provide water and vegetation for their livestock. Some states, the economic cost of drought on agricultural systems has surpassed billions of dollars. A beaver pelt can be sold in Nevada for an average of $12. Also, foxes and other carnivores are essential in keeping the ecosystem in balance as they help control species like mice or squirrels or other rodents, which can be considered nuisances in high numbers. What I'm trying to get at is that all of these fur-bearing species have tightly knit relationships and essential contributions to the environment that all affect each other. Bobcats are one of the main species desired by trappers in Nevada. And they're also essential um, in Nevada. These animals can be sold for upwards of $400 and are trapped in the thousands each year. About 2,000 2, bobcats were trapped just this year. Endow does maintain some data on bobcats, but it's not good news. Um, they require all of the bobcats to be tagged. And so they use this time to estimate the age ratios. The age ratio for 2020 was 72% lower than the 10 year average. So there's way fewer kittens and younger animals this year. Endow doesn't provide any explanation or hypothesis about why families are smaller right now, and they do not suggest any solutions or reduced trapping of these species. Families continue to be small and reproduction is down. The bobcat population will decline. In addition to legal fur-bearing species, traps may capture hundreds of non-target animals a year, including mountain lions. 103 mountain lions have been trapped since 2015, and those are just the ones that have been reported. Most non-target animals are considered released unharmed. However, I find this classification misleading as these animals have faced an extremely stressful experience in a trap. Besides physical injuries, a period of such intense stress can lead to premature death of released non-target animals like mountain lions. We have no idea what the true effects of trapping are on non-target species. All of our species are facing so many threats from climate change to drought to habitat loss, and they just don't need trapping on top of it, especially if Endow is not going to track populations. So those are just a few examples of how trapping affects our ecosystems and the, and the species that make it up. I'm gonna pass the uh, speaking baton to Michelle to talk about some of Trapper's arguments. Michelle Lute is a National Carnivore Conservation Manager for Project Coyote. She holds a PhD in wildlife management and is a conservation scientist advocate with 15 years experience in biodiversity conservation on both public and private lands. Thanks, Tessa. Uh, so as Tessa mentioned, I wanna to talk to you today about some of the uh, myths and the actual facts around trapping. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So the first myth that I want to talk to you about today is uh, a common claim that we hear from trappers, that trapping is science-based wildlife management. Um, they'll say that they need every tool in the toolbox and that this is evidence-based and there are management benefits derived from this activity. Well, as a PhD wildlife scientist, I would say that the science begs to differ. Um, we can move on to the next slide. The fact is that uh, science doesn't support trapping. Gold standard research tools, um, gold standard research, excuse me, supports that non-lethal tools are the best. So some undisputed facts about trapping from the best available scientific studies that we have to date. Trapping targets individual animals indiscriminately and thus does nothing to address conflict. If we want to address conflict, you have to target the time place in the individual involved in a particular conflict scenario. Uh, traps are set out without supervision. So any animal encountering the trap is caught. If your weight exceeds a certain limit and you step on a trap, your foot will trigger steel jaws that ensure you remain in or near that place until you starve, freeze, chew off your limb, or a trapper extinguishes your life with a shovel or strangles you after hours or days of pain. There's nothing scientific about that. Science does support non-lethal tools like uh, what you'll see in the next slide. 
uh, which is a range rider, basically a modern day shepherd whose presence is all it takes to protect vulnerable livestock from carnivores. Uh, other solutions include guard dogs. Uh, operators have even used yaks, dock, donkeys, llamas have proven effective at protecting livestock. Um, as the age old, um, as as the age old tool of fences, and in the next slide you'll see uh, a fencing option with what we call flaggery. So those red flags are called flaggery. Some people say flaggery, um, but this is also an old tool with a modern update. It can be easily deployed uh, in all kinds of of terrain. Uh, typically, it works for several weeks or even a little bit longer. So it's deployed when there are vulnerable calves or lambs on the ground. Wolves, um, by and large, and to a certain extent, coyotes do not want to walk under this flagging. Um, so it, it's an easy, simple, cheap tool to, to throw up. And th see, these are just a few examples. But the science shows, the best gold standard science shows that these are the things that work, not trapping for wildlife management and reduction of conflict. Uh, trappers would have you believe that the world would uh, be run amok with wild beasts if they're not working to keep everything in balance. Uh, but that's, that's not science, though. That's superstition and fear mongering. So the second myth I want to talk to you about is this claim that trapping helps manage populations. Well, the fact is uh, trapping doesn't regulate populations and populations don't need regulating by humans in the first place. Trapping at the level it occurs in most places is unlikely to impact populations of species like raccoons or coyotes. Although as Tess already mentioned, uh, there's not good tracking of these population numbers. So this is a bit of an assumption. Um, but in general, wildlife populations need no management by humans to maintain a certain threshold or a carrying capacity for them. Um, based on other factors. Uh, wildlife populations are just fine left to their own evolutionary devices of self-regulation and predator prey cycles. So it's true across the board that except in very rare circumstances, carnivore species do not require management to control growth because their populations are self-regulating. Uh, we've seen this for millennia. We don't need humans coming in and, and mucking up these systems. Uh, these systems are controlled by uh, social structures and density dependent factors such as territoriality, predator prey dynamics, and this carrying capacity uh, that's dictated by the land and the natural resources in it. So the third uh, myth that I wanna talk to you about today is that trapping is well regulated and safe. And we're gonna hear uh, other evidence from other people about this, but I just wanna talk to you about it for a moment. Uh, trapping is inherently indiscriminate and no amount of regulation will make them anything but unsafe to wildlife, imperiled species, humans, and their companion animals. Uh, because it is indiscriminate, trapping threatens the perilous recovery of uh, imperiled species like gray wolves and other threatened endangered species like lynx. Um, it doesn't matter how short trap check times are or how far off a trail a trap is set or whether signs are posted. An animal is going to move through the landscape based on many habitat characteristics, and they're going to encounter traps that can swiftly injure, maim, or kill them. And given the vastness of our public lands, for which we're very fortunate to be able to enjoy, uh, traps get lost, misplaced, and trapped animals languish until they die. Uh, also, because our public lands are so large, it's nearly impossible and a huge burden on our conservation officers to try and distinguish among legally set traps and illegal ones. In short, regulations don't work and it's not safe. Traps simply need to be banned. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really informative. Next, we are going to have Jeff Dixon speak. Um, Jeff is the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. He worked on the 2019 anti-trapping bill at the state legislature, and he's gonna talk about trapping from the victim's perspective. Thank, thank you, Tessa. Uh, thanks to Wild Earth Guardians for inviting the, the HSUS to participate in this great webinar. Uh, thanks for all your hard work putting it together, Tessa, and uh, to Chris for uh, Smith, who uh, is also here, um, who worked hard to get what we got in New Mexico, which really, uh, I think, sets an example, um, a template 
for other states in the West uh, going forward. So again, my name is Jeff Dixon, the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. And as Tessa said, I'm going to speak uh, to the animals uh, point of view uh, with regard to traps. Uh, all traps rely on the principle of restraining the animal. Although the three body gripping trap types are the most widely used and they cause incidentally the most suffering. They are uh, steel jaw leg hold traps, also called foothold traps, body crushing or cone bear traps, and snares, sometimes called cable restraints. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so leg hold traps are powered by strong springs that slam shut on an animal and exert excruciating force. They can cause severe pain and fear. They can tear flesh, cut tendons and ligaments and break bones. And I, I should say that, you know, you're on a trapping webinar. So what I'm, I'm describing a pretty gruesome practice. Um, some of this might find, you might find upsetting some of the things I'm describing. So just to, to be forewarned, um, continuing, uh, when animals struggle to free themselves, those injuries are aggravated and they will dislocate joints and break teeth. They may even chew or twist off a limb in their desperate struggle to escape. In Nevada, animals, uh, trapped animals can be left suffering like this for up to four days, during which they may die of blood loss, dehydration, or hypothermia, or be killed by other animals. The American Veterinary Medical Association has expressed, or the AVMA, uh, they've expressed concern about the fear and injury uh, suffered by animals in these traps in just the 24 hour window. Now imagine that agony being extended for another three days. Uh, leg hold traps are also set under water or set with weights near water so that the animal is then pulled underwater and then they drown while trying to escape. The AVMA stresses that drowning is not a humane form of euthanasia. Uh, this, this suffering is even worse for those animals who are adapted to swimming and diving for long periods, such as river otters, uh, who can hold their breath for as long as eight minutes. Uh, Cone bear traps. So they are named after their inventor and are designed to kill an animal by two rotating jaws uh, close, when two rotating jaws close on each side of the neck or chest, snapping the spinal column. Uh, that's the intent, but, um, and the intent is to kill them instantly, um, but they do so inconsistently, and that can subject the animal to unimaginable suffering. Uh, one study found the cone bear traps killed fewer than 15% of the trapped animals quickly and more than 40% of the animals caught in them had their abdomen, head, or body parts crushed and died slow and painful deaths. The news is also full of accounts of pet dogs suffocating to deaths in cone bear traps while their owners frantically tried to pry the jaws open to save them, which is nearly impossible to do. Next slide, please. So a snare trap is a loop of wire, stranded wire or wire rope designed to capture an animal by the neck or leg. Uh, they cut into skin and they, become, they can become deeply embedded, causing lacerations and tissue damage. Uh, snared animals are known to frantically chew on the cable and on their own limbs in an attempt to free themselves, uh, breaking teeth and bloodying gums in the process. They can also die of strangulation as they strangle as they struggle against the tightening wire, causing a grotesque swelling and hemorrhaging of the head, uh, referred to by trappers as jelly head. Um, they may also be hanged to death if they jump over a fence or branch in an attempt to escape. And they can sustain joint dislocation, severed tendons, or other internal injuries or snared animals may struggle uh, to near asphyxiation, then briefly recover, then struggle again, repeating this horrific cycle for several hours until they die or until the trapper returns to kill them. Next slide, please. 
So snares are silent killers of pet dogs because a dog who is hiking or hunting with their owner could become ensnared and quickly be choked to the point where they cannot vocalize. Uh, when dogs are captured in traps that clamp onto their limbs or bodies, they will bark or yelp in pain so that their owners can hear their cries and come to rescue them. But tragically, dogs captured in snares by their neck can just hunker down and pass out before slowly and quietly suffocating. Uh, there are seemingly countless uh, stories in recent years of pets across the U.S. suffering and dying uh, horribly in snares. And then the next slide. So animals who are released or escaped from a snare may later die of their injuries or suffer from their reduced ability to forage from, for food. In 2018, a then federally protected gray wolf with a snare wrapped around his muzzle was found emaciated and wandering near Duluth, Minnesota. He was shot by authorities and a Duluth wildlife rehab facility said about the wolf, quote, he may not have been able to lick up, he may have been able to look up some snow and sniff roadkill, but he had not been able to eat. He had been starving and he was a skeleton of fur and bones. So that in, in is a brief snapshot um, but just in words and pictures, I think can only do so much um, to capture the misery and suffering uh, that these animals go through when they're trapped. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we're going to have Trish Swain speak. <clears throat> After retri retirement from the local school district, Trish volunteered at Nevada Humane Society. She saw that dogs and cats are singularly protected unlike wildlife. Inspired by the spirit of a raccoon and against all advice to the contrary, she co-founded Trail Safe Nevada to work towards the elimination of cruel traps from our public lands. So we're gonna have Trish speak a little bit about her experience running this organization. Thank you very much, Tessa. Thank you everyone who is participating. And um, I want to, uh, if you would not mind going to the next slide, please. I wanna start off by uh, showing a picture of Carol Tresner, who is the co-founder of Trail Safe, who perhaps some of you watching this knew, know Carol because she was so active in the Sierra Club. She held offices, very politically savvy. And her dog Shasta had been trapped on a Sierra Club hike around 2003. And our Don Moldy, who most of you know, was fortunately around to help her get uh, Shasta out of the trap. And so naturally, uh, Carol was motivated to think about this and to worry about this. And we, uh, we got started. We got started um, later on. We talked about it for a while and then in, um, 2007. So I think the next slide would be a good idea at this point, please. Um, yeah, uh, then we, uh, Carol knew what we were supposed to do, which I did not know as a complete novice at the time. And uh, this had happened in 2007. This is Carol Grigas and her dog Duke. And Duke was trapped in a very popular hiking area, which is the Galena Trails. Here are the uh, trails that are available up in the Galena area. People are up there all year long. They snowshoe, they come every season, and many people bring their pets. And so Duke was trapped and this hit the newspapers. And that made uh, a, a number of us aware. We started communicating through the comments in the newspaper and so forth. And eventually uh, we did succeed in our first effort. Carol, um, Carol Tresner and I went to the Department of Wildlife where we wrote a draft, a draft petition and, to, um, and it went very smoothly. We wrote a petition, we asked for a thousand feet uh, setback and we did get it for these trails. And we did get this very pleasant note, which I saw in my, my uh, files the other day, and I was really pleased to see it. Very pleasant, cordial note from the wildlife commissioners. So that was our first effort, and we did get this accomplished through the uh, petition process. And again, uh, I absolutely agree with Michelle that regulation goes just so far. It is certainly not what we're after. We're after uh, 
no trapping on our public lands, but that's gonna take a long time. So this was our first effort. And then let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay, the next uh, trapping that, uh, trapping event that caught everybody's eye in the newspaper happened in Cottonwood Park. And this is Cottonwood Park, which is within the city limits, which is designated for family recreation. So children are playing in the river here, but traps were set at this time in 2010. And this little skunk was caught. And this animal here happens to be a domestic cat. It's hard to tell. I mean, he dried out, he looked pretty good. And they had spent the night trapped in the river. And the uh, Department of Wildlife wardens did, did want to do something about this. I guess they had been notified. I, I'm not sure who notified them. I, anyway, they were notified. And uh, they, because there was no trap registration or ID on any of these traps at that time, they had to stake out the area for 20 hours waiting until the trapper showed up. And indeed he did show up to check his traps. And so he got a very light penalty for considering the danger that this posed to the public. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay, well, uh, the upshot of, of this event in the park motivated us to go ahead and uh, get, get active with legislation because uh, we, it, we go, went ahead and sought, leg, leg, excuse me, I'm getting a little lost here. Okay, we uh, were not working by ourselves. By this time, we had done a lot of tabling. We had done a lot of outreach and we had attracted some very, very competent and professional people to the cause we felt at the time was right for approaching the legislature. And so we did achieve SB 226 in 2011. And this was an effort to, uh, to, to eliminate the kind of problem that we had seen in Cottonwood Park. And through a series of meetings with the Wildlife Commission and through various uh, political, um, uh, political influences, we ended up with the, what we got here, which was congested areas in Washoe County and some selected Clark County areas, they amount to very little in terms of geography, very few areas are actually protected from trapping, but we have, we did achieve this in 2011. So then we'll go on to the next slide, please. And that will take us up to um, 2013. And in 2013, we had uh, two objectives. We went back to the legislature. Again, we had a very effective team working with us. So we weren't doing all this by ourselves. And what we were after was first of all, to do something about trap registration. There had been another incident where game wardens had to do a 130 hour stakeout and um, the waste of manpower, the waste of money, it is just so ineffective. So it, essentially there is no way that the limited number of game wardens that we have in our state could cover all the trap violations and all the uh, complaints from the public. So we did get to, to SB 213 uh, enacted and we did get registration on traps mandated. So that was our primary goal. And uh, actually what happened was then in subsequent legislative sessions, this went back and forth. So uh, there's a story there, but anyway, we did achieve this in 2013. And we also asked for a reduction in that dreadful 96 hour visitation time that Tessa told us about, but we did not manage to do that. And the reason we did not is that we uh, fell into a, a bureaucratic morass, I would call it, where we had a, uh, trap regulation committee set up by the Wildlife Commission. And they scheduled meetings monthly over the period of a year. They had presented their map of areas that they thought should have shorter visitation times. Of course, we were asking for 24 hours throughout the state, but all we got was some dots on the map after a year of wrangling and contentious meetings for, to which we had to travel all over the state at our own expense. 
And so we were manipulated, I think, because we had no representation on this committee, whereas the trappers did. And that was the result that we really still have a 96 hour visitation time throughout the state, except for, for very tiny areas in Washington and Clark counties, which um, was it. So um, I have a picture here of a ID tag because finally we do have um, ID on traps. So uh, next slide, I think, please. Okay, then we're up to uh, 2017. And by this time, we, uh, again, we still had a very effective team working with us, wonderful people. And again, these, these issues are very important to Nevadans. And every hearing that we had filled rooms to overflowing, filled the largest hearing rooms that we had. These issues are highly contentious and very important to so many people. And so we had, um, SB 364, where we suggested four measures. And the first measure was successful. Again, as I say, trap registration had gone back and forth over several legislative sessions, but we did achieve this. And so for the first time, we could have not only registration numbers that are issued by the Toronto Wildlife on traps, we could also have trappers to opt to put their ID on their traps. So this, as far as I know, is being respected. People are applying for registration numbers. The last time I checked with the Department of Wildlife. But again, this is one of those issues that could go back and forth depending upon the fortunes in the legislature. Okay, now again, what we gained was the public has a right to move or, or disable a trap. Uh, and uh, assuming this trap poses a risk, which all of them do, as a matter of fact. I mean, if you're not expecting it, you don't know what's going to happen. It poses a risk. So this had been a gray area and people were afraid to touch traps. So I think that it was uh, beneficial to the public. And then we also achieved uh, something that so many people, when we polled the state, had asked for. And what they had asked for is signs warning them that traps would be set in a particular area. So we did achieve a, a measure within this law that says state land management agencies must post trap warning signs. And although the federal uh, land managers are not obliged to follow this state law, they agreed to. We had meetings, very successful meetings with both the Forest Service and the BLM. The Forest Service has already put up signs in the Carson District, as far as I know. And uh, we think if we follow up on this, we're gonna see more signage throughout the state. And then uh, finally, we tried again with the 96 hours. We tried for 24 hours, which admittedly is still too long for an animal to suffer in a trap, but we were not successful. And there it lies a long political story, which I do not have time to tell you at this time. So that, that is what we did. And, um, I think that it's time then for me to talk about uh, animals being trapped and these stories that we hear because we, uh, on our website, we do have over 110 stories of animals being trapped. And I think that's just the um, tip of the iceberg. I think it's hard to get stories. And one of them I wanted to share with you is Gary Parr. And here's his dog, Nanny Kula. There's Gary with, with her. And what happened was he was walking her in November of 2013. And he, he ran into one of the cotton bear traps that was described to you by Jeff. And he says, I watched in horror as my beloved golden retriever's life ended right in front of my eyes. Despite my efforts to release her from the grasp of the iron trap that had snapped around her neck and head, squeezing the life from her by suffocation. He went through this and then he adds, I too was severely injured my right hand, thumb, and hand received deep lacerations that required multiple stitches to close. I was also told by the ER doctor that I may need further treatment by surgeons to repair the damage done. So there's one story. And uh, thank you, for Gary, for sharing. He couldn't be with us tonight. And someone who is with us tonight, someone for whom I'm very grateful for all her activism in Southern Nevada, is Stephanie Myers. Thanks, Trish. You know, there wasn't much snow that winter of 2000 in Mount Charleston, which is just outside Las Vegas at 8,000 feet. 
So I could mountain bike with my dog, Sonny, as we usually did on a four wheel drive road called Max Canyon, which is four miles long. Somewhere along the ride, I lost track of her. And at first I thought, oh, she's just run after a rabbit or something, but you know, she never did that. So that would have been very unusual. I rode my bike up and down calling for her no response. I got in my car and I drove up and down that road for hours with all of the windows down on that chilly January day calling for her. But she didn't bark. I was hoping she would. She didn't bark. Um, so I finally went home. I called a friend. We went back and we continued calling. And then he said, well, where is the last place that you saw her? And we concentrated our search in that area. Up the hill a couple hundred feet there she was with her foot caught in that big, ugly metal leg hold trap. And it was attached very firmly to a bush nearby so she couldn't have moved to respond to my calling. And uh, she, uh, she was agitated and her mouth was all bloody because she'd been biting on the trap. I, I was really glad that she wasn't biting on her own leg but she was biting on the trap. It never occurred to me that she could be caught in a lake hole trap because I thought that such things, such archaic things just didn't even exist in this century, but they do. There weren't any signs to warn, warn me about anything like that. I'm glad I had my friend with me because I never could have gotten that trap off by myself, but luckily he was finally able to do it and he carried Sonny back to my car. I took her to an emergency vet because by that time it was after hours and they had to do emergency surgery to remove five teeth because she'd been biting so hard on that metal trap that she had broken those teeth. As I waited for her, I, I tried to think what I could have done differently so that she didn't have to go through that pain and that shock. Uh, I felt guilty about not finding her sooner. I did uh, call the Nevada Department of Wildlife and Dow, and they sent a guy out, but all he really wanted to do was to uh, demand that I return the trap, uh, which I did, uh, that looked just like this that I have in my hand now. Sunny recovered physically, but um, her spirit was never quite the same, and she died in about a year after that. First, I thought I was like the only one who had a dog trapped in a leg hole trap, and I was really mad. And it took me some time to find Trish Swain and Trail Safe. But after I did, I started attending every single Wildlife Commission meeting and every single county advisory board to manage wildlife, the CABs they're called. Um, and I still do to this day. I told them the story about Sunny, this board, and I was just really surprised at their insensitive response. Matter of fact, they were actually hostile to me. And then I realized, well, you know, these guys that are on the board, they're the same ones that probably set traps, just like, just like the one that got Sunny. And so I vowed to try to change things. Um, it's been a long slog with very few successes. In 2012, we were able to get 25 trails, uh, picnic uh, areas and campgrounds protected by, from traps in the Mount Charleston area by a thousand feet. But sadly, things are pretty much the same as they were back in 2000. And thank you for listening to my story. We've got a little bit of TV footage um, from back during that incident that we're going to share here now, too. Area at Mount Charleston is a seemingly perfect place to hike, bike, and take our pets for a run. But did you know that wild animal trapping is legal there? One pet owner found out the hard way her dog Sunshine was caught in the trap. But are other hikers and pets at risk as well? Christy Mahoney has some answers in her focus report. Let's go biking. Come on. That's it. Stephanie Myers and her dog Sunshine love to go biking together along Max Canyon Road in Lee Canyon. But in January, near the middle of Bobcat and Gray Fox trapping season, Sunshine wandered off during a ride and didn't come back. And so she was caught right there for six hours. 
Sunshine was caught in a trap like this one, a steel leg hold trap. Adult humans can usually shake these traps off fairly easily. Yeah, if you're just walking along and you would step into a trap, it doesn't do anything. But for dogs, it's not so easy. And so she started biting on the, on the trap itself. And that's where she broke five teeth sagittally, and they had to be surgically removed. Sunshine has healed now, but Stephanie is still spooked by the incident. Nevada Division of Wildlife officials say keeping pets on a leash will prevent these types of accidents. But Stephanie says no way. I didn't move up to Lee Canyon to keep my dog on a leash. The, the, um, my dog is under complete voice command. When I call Sunny, Sunny comes. Come, Sunny, come, come, come. Good girl, sit. It never occurred to me to keep her right by my side because I didn't know that there were traps around. Trapping season is over for now, so there should be no danger to hikers or their pets. That is, if trappers removed all their traps at the end of the season. But wildlife officials say there's no law requiring them to do that. The law does set a season, November 1st through February 29th this year. After that date, while the traps don't have to be removed, they do have to be sprung. And wildlife officials say most trappers do remove their traps so they don't rust. However, coyote traps, yeah. similar to this one, can be set all year. So they could be open and ready to trap even now. Christine Mahoney, Fox 5 News at 10. Coming up in part two. So that was in 2000. And people and animals are still suffering, as we've heard. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing your story. It's really moving. Next, we're going to have Chris Smith speak. Um, Chris is the Southwest Wildlife Advocate for Wild Earth Guardians. He works to ensure that native wildlife is protected and respected and allowed to contribute to the fragile mountain and desert ecosystems across the region. Um, he worked to pass a public lands trapping ban in New Mexico, and he's going to be talking about what he learned there. Thank you, Tessa, and thanks to all the other panelists, and especially Trish for your years of effort and Stephanie for sharing your story. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time because I realize we're, we're getting on, but I did want to share a few lessons from the effort in New Mexico that resulted this last spring in Roxy's law passing the legislature and being signed into law, which bans trapping across public lands in New Mexico and will take effect next April. Um, you know, people, people oppose trapping. Um, the polling shows that uh, across the West, actually across the United States, um, including in New Mexico, where nearly two thirds of voters oppose traps and poisons um, outright, not just on public lands. And in Nevada, um, the case is similar and HSUS has, has done some polling that indicates that. Um, so when people, dislike something or like something, um, it's only a matter of time before our system of democracy takes that into account and, and connects policy to those sentiments. And so people power is really, really important in this effort and enrolling people to, to speak their voice and to speak their truth and to speak their values to the systems that we have um, to set policy and laws. A lot of people don't know that trapping is legal or as widespread as it is, um, as we heard Stephanie suggest. Um, that's the case nearly everywhere. Um, people see trapping as kind of a, a vestige from, from centuries past, and, um, and they don't think that it's happening right now. And you know, that, that takes raising awareness with you know, things as small as this webinar, um, things as small as discussing it around the dinner table or with your neighbors. Um, to raise that awareness, to educate people about um, the problems that trapping poses to, to ecosystems, to wildlife, to, to animal welfare, um, and to, to outdoor recreation economies, and to all kinds of things. Um, and it requires speaking truth to power. And we heard Michelle Lute, who has a doctorate in wildlife management, talk to um, what science really suggests about trapping, um, as opposed to some of the, the myths, or at least the outdated data that trapping is built upon. Um, it takes a lot of patience to, to do this work and to make real gains. Um, the effort in New Mexico was over a decade long, and we've already heard from Trish, who's, Trish and Stephanie, who have spent a long time 
working on this in Nevada. Um, but but the truth is that um, decision making bodies like game commissions and wildlife departments um, are all stacked um, to support trapping. Um, as as Stephanie said, you know some of the the commissioners on these on these boards are are in fact trappers, um, and that's a vestige of a, a long and complicated history of agriculture and wildlife persecution in the West. And I want to talk also about that history, which is that you know trapping, recreational trapping, widespread commercial trapping, is not the norm. Um, you know this kind of trapping has only existed for 150, maybe 200 years. In North America, and certainly there was some wildlife trapping that trapping that predates that by indigenous peoples, but it was for very different reasons and at a very different scale. Um, and prior to to you know the mid 19th century, people and wildlife coexisted um, without the need to to persecute them, to kill them in mass numbers, and to trap them. Um, and so I just think those are four things that are worth worth remembering as people engage in this effort. Um, and what we get asked a lot is, you know, this is such a big thing. How on earth can I play a role? And I will, I'll send an email around um, either tomorrow or early next week to those of you who have attended this, this webinar um, articulating some of these things. But, but you need to talk to your elected officials. You know, every, every American pretty much knows who the president is, and some of them know who some senators are, and maybe someone knows their congressperson. But but most people don't know who their state elected officials are. And those are the people who are making decisions that impact your life more than others. And often they're just a phone call or an email away um, from having a cup of coffee with them. And I think that's the case in Nevada. Um, letters to the editor in your local papers. I know that's been a, an ongoing thing in Nevada and was in New Mexico, but it's another easy way to reach a big audience and to, to let your voice be known. And then finally, I go back to this this idea of raising awareness. You know, people, when they find out that trapping is legal on public lands, they oppose it. Um, and they need to be made aware of that in order to do so. And so, you know, engaging your friends, your family, your fellow Nevadans, your neighbors, anyone um, who you happen to talk to and telling them what you've learned tonight or what you already know is really important. So um, I will leave you with that and turn it back over to Tessa. Thanks, Chris. I just want to thank everyone for joining us and all of our panelists for speaking and sharing their expertise and their years of activism and involvement for native wildlife and for um, companion animals and for people. Um, we're going to open it up for questions if anyone has um, anything they like to ask or any comments to share. So if you do have a question, go ahead and type it in the Q&A. There have been some already answered. Um, and uh, if, you, if you might have a question in the future, but you don't have it right now, you're welcome to, to email us. Um, my email is public on the Wild Earth Guardians website, and we'd be happy to get back to you then. So no pressure right now. We'll give it another, another 30 seconds, but, but maybe folks have, have had enough. This is an intense topic. and. Um, that may be plenty. All right, we got a, a question from Stephanie. Um, comes from a state that has banned trapping, but um, visits Montana and Idaho where they trap. Um, spends a lot of money there. Who do you reach out to? Um, Stephanie, that's a really good question. Um, you know, outdoor recreation and tourism are two industries that that rely on a state having, you know, not only beautiful natural assets, but also, um, you know, positive reputations in the way they treat those assets. Um, and I see Montana and Idaho trending especially poorly right now in those in those respects. Um, so uh, I would reach out to a group called Footloose Montana. Um, and I'm happy to share this if you want to email me. Um, and I believe um, Western Watershed Projects and maybe Natural Resources Defense Council are both both pretty active in Idaho, but I'll have to check that out. Um, but email me um, if you'd like to, to learn more. But that's, you know, we hear that a lot in New Mexico is 
you know, why would I come to your state and spend money um, if my dog is going to get trapped or if I'm going to encounter trapped wildlife or if I'm not going to encounter wildlife because it's been trapped in mass? So that's a great question. Um, and thanks for thanks for asking it. Uh, we got another question from Oliver that's actually directed at Don. Um, so uh, I'm going to see if I can actually take take Don off mute. I don't know if I'm able to, but I'm going to try to see if um, if Don would like to answer this question about um, the abuse of the public trust in terms of spending um, and attacking that, uh, presumably in the courts. So I'm going to see if I can take you off mute here, Don. I think I've done that. Okay, we are, are we on? You're on. So I'm not sure of the question. Um, is it an abuse of the public trust in terms of spending? Um, and I assume this is referencing your, your earlier comment about um, licenses not bringing in um, money to cover the program. Is that, does that ring a bell? I'm oh. looking, I'm looking through the other questions. Let's see. Well, I think Oliver uh, was referencing the California um, uh, situation where Bobcat trap, uh, where California has a law that requires um, programs to pay for themselves, if you will. Uh, and that was one of the levers that the uh, anti-trapping uh, coalition used to dump trapping of bobcats in California because the program, it was not paying for itself according to state law. In Nevada, we have a different situation. The Department of Wildlife does not track programs by uh, detailed costs, for example, as to how much, uh, whether trappers, for example, pay for all of the costs of trapping in Nevada. Uh, NDAO does not do that. Uh, but we know clearly that trappers do not pay for their program because a thousand trappers at 40 bucks a trapping license uh, contributes $40,000 of revenue to the department. But we also know that law enforcement spends a lot of time on trapping. All you have to do is go to the commission meetings and listen to Tony Wosley talk about uh, uh, law enforcement activity during trapping season and also look at some of the cases that they have brought, for example, against Joel Blakesley and others uh, who have been nailed for trapping violations, the Felton case, for example, and uh, get an idea of how much time law enforcement spends on this and uh, the uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife Law Enforcement Division has an annual budget of approximately $7 million. If, uh, the, uh, if the law enforcement division spends 10% of its time on trapping enforcement, and in my opinion, that's a low number, that's $700,000 of their budget to, to uh, go after a program that produces $40,000 in license revenue. So we know unequivocally that trapping is supported by other monies from the Department of Wildlife. It is a subsidized program. It does not pay for itself, not even close. Now, the department does argue that if we're gonna ask all programs to pay for themselves, then we're not gonna have a biodiversity program. We're not gonna have an education program. We're not gonna have other programs that produce no revenue. So it's a bit of a slippery slope. Uh, to um, you know, to go that direction, depending on on how we manage it. But anyway, I think that's what Oliver is talking about. A California issue that we don't have the uh, uh, option to do here because our laws are different. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it, and hopefully that answered um, Oliver's question. Travis Chilson has asked a question, and it looks like Michelle is, is providing him an answer. Um, Don also asked a question, which is why doesn't the Nevada Department of Wildlife and Wildlife Commission take action to protect mountain lions from incidental trapping? And I'm wondering if um, Jeff or Trish or Stephanie um, would like to touch on that. I can say something. Uh, that is a good question. They are, you know, they're not a representative body. Um, I think has been mentioned before. They are sort of stacked against us. 
uh, five of the nine members hold a hunting license. And then you have a member from ranching, farming, uh, and then a conservationist, and then a uh, member of the general public. So they're just not in, inclined. Uh, I don't think, you know, it, we, we could ask them in the future uh, as they kind of go through what they're thinking about right now, which is, you know, wondering, you know, I, I think they're grappling with the hard reality that they are, that times are changing, that times have changed and that they risk losing uh, some of their power if they continue to defy uh, the public's uh, will. Um, what they hold near and dear is not the ability to uh, trap mountain lions or for, for to trap in, in ways that catch non-target species like mountain lion, which I think most Nevadans, even those who otherwise uh, accept or just tolerate uh, fishing and uh, hunting, they're, they're not going to go for that, just like they don't go for other uh, things um, within the you know consumptive use uh, practice. So that's a, I think it bears, uh, it, it, it says that we ought to be engaging with them because you do have some members there who are receptive and who understand the political reality and times are changing. But I think something like that would be um, hard for them to, to be able to do as they are currently constructed, unless, uh, you know, in, in any campaign that we have going forward um, or that's had, you know, we highlight things like the non-target species who get caught up in this practice. And perhaps that would light a fire under them um, as they feel the pressure and as they want to hold on to what they have. Um, that, that could force some action, but, um, you know, Don, you've been watching this, this group for a long time and, uh, you know, things have sort of accelerated in this space in the last few years. Um, so I, I never say never, but I, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't bet on it in the, last, in the next five years unless something drastically changes uh, in terms of how the Wildlife Commission is composed. And by that, I mean um, them being majority hunting license holders. So I hope that uh, gives some, shed some light on the topic. Thanks, Jeff. I think we're done with questions, Tessa. Um, perfect. Thank you all again for participating, for engaging, um, and for, for being active citizens of Nevada and wildlife lovers. Um, so thanks again. I think we're going to sign off. Um, keep looking for information from Chris, from HSUS, from Project Coyote and Trail Safe um, about future action to take against trapping in Nevada. <laughs>